We have some exciting news to share. Future Hindsight is now in partnership with Lyceum, a new audio platform for the curious and creative to listen, learn, and connect. Sounds like it's a perfect place for us. Here's a message from the founder. Hi, I'm Zachary Davis. I'm the host of two podcasts, Ministry of Ideas, which explores the philosophy behind everyday concepts, and Writ Large, a new podcast about the books that change the world. I love educational podcasts. I love listening to them and talking about them. I want everyone to have that chance. And so I've built a new platform called Lyceum, which makes it easy to discover great educational podcasts and have conversations about them. There are more than a million podcasts out there. We've done the hard work of sifting through them and finding only the very best education shows to listen to. Shows like the one you're listening to right now. So if you love learning, Download Lyceum today on the App Store or Google Play, or visit us at lyceum.fm. That's L-Y-C-E-U-M dot F-M. Welcome to Future Hindsight. I'm your host, Mila Atmos. Each week, I speak with citizen changemakers who spark civic engagement in our society. Our guest today is Dr. Ken Bissler, Director of the Center for Marine and Environmental Radioactivity and Senior Scientist at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. He specializes in the study of natural and man-made radioactive elements in the ocean, such as fallout from atmospheric nuclear weapons testing, the impact of Chernobyl on the Black Sea, and radioactive contamination in the Pacific from the Fukushima nuclear power plants. In this episode, we learn a lot about the science of nuclear energy, and we also talk about an exciting citizen science project where everyday citizens work hand-in-hand with scientists to test the radioactivity of water. I hope that you find this to be a valuable complement to the two episodes about whether nuclear energy is the optimal solution to decarbonize. Don't scare people from swimming, say, off California because we can measure cesium there. We've always been able to measure cesium there ever since we tested nuclear weapons. So Fukushima Daiichi, the accidents and the earthquake were 2011. By 2014, along the coastline, we're seeing much lower levels of cesium on the west coast of North America. Swimming every single day in the ocean for eight hours would cause an additional dose, so health risk from the cesium, but it was about a thousand times less risky than a single dental x-ray. We'll discuss ways of thinking about radioactivity in the ocean and how you can support ocean science and ocean health. Let's listen in. Thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure to be here. So you have a deep background on studying natural and man-made radionuclides in the ocean. We know that radioactivity is a natural phenomenon to a certain extent. How should we think about ocean radiation in this context? And What are the sources of natural radionuclides? Well, I think it's important, as you said, to realize we live in this radioactive world in a lot of ways because there are natural sources that can be like salt in the ocean. There's dissolved radioactive elements, uranium, thorium, potassium-40. And so we're exposed all the time when we're in the ocean or on land. What's happened since the advent of the nuclear era is we've added to that nuclear weapons testing, disasters like Chernobyl and Fukushima. Thankfully, often at small amounts, but highly concentrated in certain areas. So there's a global distribution of radioactivity that's natural. And on top of that, what humans have added by their activities. So what is a normal level? We measure things in these crazy units called sieverts. Two and a half in those units per year is kind of something that you're exposed to on average. We've almost doubled that in the U.S. by medical testing. Things like CAT scans give you a pretty high dose. So we choose for good reasons, often medical reasons, to increase our dose so we can double that. The higher altitude cities end up with more radiation dose because of what we call cosmic radiation, what's coming from above. Or if you live in areas New England, classically the granite rocks release more radioactive decay products, things like radon gas, you may have heard of, so our basements tend to be higher sources. So that amount can change depending on where you live and some of your habits, like medical habits and the food you eat. Okay. Our basements. I did not know that. That sounds scary. But so I guess it isn't scary is kind of the point. Yes. 
Well, it's what you kind of have to live with and what's important to kind of know sometimes is you know when to be concerned because any additional dose does increase your chances for health effects. Scientists have very, very sensitive methods to measure radioactivity everywhere, every sample, air, water, food we eat. So it's how much more are you adding and how long are you exposed to those additional sources that matter the most. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about your process. How do you track radioactivity in water and or marine life? Yeah, so I'm a marine scientist that typically I'll go out on a research ship. We'll put some sampling devices in the water that close different layers of the ocean, different depths, and you bring that water back on the boat. And typically, given the low levels that we measure, we have to take that back to the lab painstakingly kind of separate all radioactive forms of cesium from the background, from uranium and other isotopes that are there, and then take that smaller now sample we've reduced from something maybe five gallons in size of seawater down to something the size of the tip of your finger, and that's more concentrated in those radioactive forms of cesium, and that goes to a detector that's very sensitive at measuring these things, where it sits for 24, 48 hours, a couple of days, so that enough decay happens, the process of radioactive decay emits a signal that we can detect, but there's not a lot of it there, and it's often hidden by other naturally occurring isotopes. So it's kind of a long process going from the sample to a lab and then to an analysis of a radioactivity level in each sample. So can you actually discern what's a naturally occurring radioactive level and what's man-made in that little bit of water that you've collected? Yeah, absolutely. There are different forms of cesium, which have different radioactive properties, and the time it takes for them to decay varies. So similar to a fingerprint, I could tell if I took a sample in the Pacific Ocean today, how much of the cesium was there before Fukushima and what came from the more recent source from Japan because of those isotope variations in cesium. Mm, So the cesium that comes from Fukushima is different than cesium from another place, let's say? Yes, it's different in its original composition, but also in its more recent release. So things that have, we call them half-lifes, part of the decay properties or radiation properties, a certain amount is lost, you know, 50% over a certain amount of time. Cesium has an isotope that decays with a two-year half-life, cesium-134. There's also an isotope that has a 30-year half-life, 137. And it's the longer-lived forms that have been with us since we started testing nuclear weapons, mostly peaking in the 50s and 60s. So we have that background everywhere. And then on top of that, in 2011, in the case of Fukushima, we added this more recent source. So that's where you pick up the cesium-134 that could only come from a more recent source like a nuclear accident. How does radiation travel in the ocean? How does that work? Well, it's a good question because there are many different radionuclides, so things that emit radiation, and they have different properties. And they range from what we call soluble, things that largely move with ocean currents because they're less likely to attach to particles that sediment out on the seafloor, They have relatively low uptake into the food chain. So when we wanted to predict what happened to cesium, we would talk to the physical oceanographers who look at ocean currents and track those currents with measurements of cesium. Now, there are other types of elements. Uh, Plutonium is a a classic. It was not emitted in, in very large amounts at all from Japan, but it was from the nuclear weapons testing. And that is more sediment bound. So it goes in the ocean and quickly becomes associated with those particles that settle to the seafloor. So you have kind of a range of extremes. And we have hundreds, if not thousands of these radionuclides and dozens or hundreds of different chemistries. I work in a chemistry department in part because it allows me to understand the fate chemically of these different isotopes in the ocean and where they might end up. You have a long background in doing research on nuclear weapons testing and the effect on the ocean, and you also have some background in Chernobyl. How does your knowledge there inform your research on Fukushima? One is just the kind of fortuitous timing in that 
I had studied things like the fallout from weapons testing in the 80s and then Chernobyl in 86. That work allowed me to have the skills to make measurements of radioactivity at very low levels, whether they're man-made, like plutonium or cesium, or whether they're these other elements that occur naturally, thorium and uranium. So the analytical techniques are pretty similar. Thankfully, the time frame between Chernobyl and Fukushima, less had happened. In fact, the whole kind of support for research had died down to the point there are very few of us left who knew how to measure some of these radioactive compounds. So I was able to kind of revive some of the methods we had basically mothballed and not used in, in a decade or more and bring those to bear on the more recent accident in 2011. And then just in general, the radioactivity tells us something about how old the sample is, how fast that water has moved, things that are more about the ocean than about impacts to human health and security. So a lot of the work in between these disasters is about how the ocean works using natural or human-made radioactivity to tell us about those timescales. So what has the impact of Fukushima been on the Pacific Ocean or on the ocean in general? Now, nine years later, a lot of the work is more about long-term effects, what these radioactive releases tell us about the ocean. The immediate concern and still ongoing concern that I share is with human exposure and uptake into the food chain. The Japanese were immediately closing the fisheries off of their east coast of Japan near Fukushima Daiichi, where the levels of that radioactive form of cesium were over 10 million times higher after that accident. So of great concern to that local fisheries, because if you, at that time, uh, consume those fish, you would get a relatively high dose. Our questions early on were, what were the levels in seafood, water, seafloor sediments, uh, and how quickly they would decrease due to the natural ocean processes and the radioactive decay properties. And a lot of that was directly of uh, concern to the human consumers and people who lived along that ocean. So did the fish die after the radiation? I feel like I've not seen that any place where the fish actually died in the area right after the accident. There were no massive die-offs. In the first couple of months, the levels were high enough if fish lived there for a period of time, they would have reproductive effects, potential mortality. That's when you're in the tens of millions of times higher zone. We didn't stay there very long. In early April, nine years ago, that's when the amount of radioactivity was at its height. That Within only a few months, we were down to a point where the levels in seafood that you would consume and internalize as humans would be above the regulatory thresholds that are set. But the fish themselves, you would not see any sort of die-off, and we did not see that at all in Japan. In fact, reports of that around the world are, are certainly exaggerated. I think that's one of the problems is every time people see a dead bird or a dead fish, they say, oh, that, that was Fukushima, when in fact the levels weren't high enough to directly cause mortalities. About five years ago is when all of the fish in the entire coastline are below Japan's regulatory threshold for radioactive cesium. And there were limits and bans basically on fishing in those areas. And now we're kind of beyond that point, but still anxious to see because those reactors, some of the radiation that fell on land is returning to the ocean. So there's still going to be years and decades of monitoring and study that is needed to ensure that conditions don't change, that levels stay low. You know, even when levels are low, it's worth measuring. Tell us about that. Why is it worth measuring, even if it's low? Well, one thing, it's simply this word baseline. You want to know how much was there. When an accident happens, what was there before that? Uh, secondly, as a scientist, you kind of want to know how long do these things hang around? Can we do a better job of predicting the fate of, say, a radioactive release? When people started to model that plume, the radiation coming with the ocean currents across the Pacific from Japan to the west coast of North America, California, Oregon. The models differed by up to a year and 10 times in terms of the levels that were going to arrive. You'd really want to know that pretty precisely to uh, allow people to get out of harm's way or close off fisheries. So data we gather, even at low levels, informs us for future accidents or other releases. <laughs> 
So how does this compare to the radiation that was put in the ocean during the Marshall Island nuclear weapons tests? You said earlier that essentially that stuff is all on the ocean floor as sediment. What's the difference to the ocean in terms of the health of the ocean? Just to correct something, not all of the radioactivity ends up on the seafloor. That's an example for specifically plutonium. Cesium and strontium, 90 from those tests in the 50s and 60s, are still moving around the ocean currents. But let's put some scale on this. Uh, let's talk about cesium. It's relatively easy to measure, and everywhere we've done testing or had nuclear accidents, it's been released. So there's about 10 times more cesium-137 released back in the 50s and 60s when we tested the nuclear weapons in the atmosphere. So that delivered as fallout closer to nuclear testing sites. The levels were higher, like the Marshall Islands in the Pacific. But that number is 10 times higher than Chernobyl, which is about three to five times higher than Fukushima. So that still remains the largest source of most of these long-lived isotopes that last for decades or centuries in terms of the radioactive decay like cesium-137, plutonium, strontium-90. The lingering effects can be quite long-lived, in part because this radioactivity just doesn't go away by itself until it decays. And we're talking hundreds of years for cesium to be removed by radioactive decay and many, many thousands of years for things like plutonium. There's a background radiation throughout the Pacific on land from that fallout in the 50s and 60s of several isotopes that are still with us. I have a question about decay. How does it work? Well, radiation is basically a, a physical breakdown of an unstable atom into something else. And as it breaks apart, whether it's uranium or cesium decay, it releases this high energy particle. That's the radioactivity that causes health effects and we're concerned about. And it decays into some other element. We call these things often parents and daughters. So there's a decayed chain as it decays, and it might end up being stable at that point, or it might decay to something else. So we have an element that occurs like cesium, and it decays now into another element form, and then that eventually will decay further. The half-life, the time it takes for half of that cesium to undergo this process is 30 years. So it's a pretty long half-life uh, some elements, they're only around for fractions of a second, and some half-lives are thousands of years, hundreds of thousands, if not a million years. So you have a very large range of stabilities for different isotopes, different forms of numbers of protons and neutrons, right? different forms of these uh, atoms. And that's a very characteristic property, physical property that you can't change. That's one way we can say where the radiation is coming from or by measuring these different radioactive decay properties. Mm -hmm. Yeah, got it. What is the biggest misconception about radioactivity in the ocean that you would like to dispel? Don't scare people from swimming, say, off California, because we can measure cesium there. We've always been able to measure cesium there ever since we tested nuclear weapons. So Fukushima Daiichi, the accidents and the earthquake were 2011. By 2014, along the coastline, we're seeing much lower levels of cesium on the west coast of North America. So you can do some calculations of how much harm is that, because people were concerned, and we wanted to address that. We didn't have measurements early on, but just by making some assumptions of what the concentrations would be, swimming every single day in the ocean for eight hours would cause an additional dose, so health risk from the cesium, but it was about a thousand times less risky than a single dental x-ray. Now we're choosing to get dental x-rays, but when something is that small of a health risk, then I certainly don't have a concern from swimming in that ocean or eating fish from that ocean. Yeah, thank you for putting that in perspective. How do you collect your data? Because this is uh, actually super interesting for the show that is about civic engagement. Since there were no measurements being made, a lot of alarming things showed up on the web. You know, every dead fish was attributed to Fukushima, and we didn't have data to show that. The frustrating thing as a scientist, all the programs that were around in the 80s when I started my studies, federal funding had disappeared. So there's no one who would support 
my taking a ship there to do a proper research cruise. But realizing that it's relatively easy to collect a sample, fill up a bucket with five gallons of water, we set up a crowdfunded citizen scientist campaign. I said, oh, look, if you want to know the level at your beach, we'll send you a kit. You can collect it and send it back to my lab. And in about a week, I can put a number out there. So we formed our Radioactive Ocean, a citizen scientist website, thousands that ended up now being successful in, in both numbers of samples. We have over 300 data points now up and down the West Coast documenting what the levels were, the arrival time of the cesium. It met some of these lower predictions. In fact, the levels today on the California coast are lower for cesium than when we were testing nuclear weapons in the 60s when we had more direct fallout. The best part of it were the people looking for information. So we put a lot of information there on radioactivity, what is it? What are the effects? That type of thing. Well, that's exciting. What is, uh, in your mind, the most surprising finding from this project, our radioactive ocean? Well, I think it's the people's passion. Once people get directly involved in collecting samples, they want to learn more. And we set it up as kind of a usually group-funded sites. You know, you wanted to sample Laguna Beach. Okay, you could either send us 500 bucks, or we had a website where you could ask your friends to donate so the surprising thing was, you know, the range of groups we had surfing groups in Santa Cruz have fundraising campaigns for this. We had individuals donating for several samples. They just wanted information right right away. And over a million other people logged on to the website to see what those results were. So surprising the large interest and then the engagement really brings that forward in a really productive way. And I had no control over where they, they would go. There were a lot of samples near major population centers, as you might imagine. And as a scientist, you'd maybe distribute them more evenly. But at the end of the day, we've written at least one research publication on those results. Uh, every time we get a data point, we put it up online. People were in some ways concerned. How can you do that? That's not you know up to academic standards. And what if someone tried to fool you? Well, we could go back. We could get another sample. We can check on that. In fact, we had no real negative responses or any sort of shenanigans that we had to deal with. So we're often taught that scientists should be impartial and provide only facts. In the battle against climate change and or the way that people have been spreading misinformation about, for example, radioactivity in the ocean, do you think there's room for scientist activists? Well, I think, you know, providing the information <laughs> is a big part of that activism, right? My role, I think, is best served when I can get results and explain them in a clear way to the public. And I think that's where our radioactive ocean, the citizen scientist campaign, became so successful because not only could we help people understand what radioactivity is and how much was in their backyard, we could actually, you know, as scientists make measurements to actually build up a database on the West Coast that didn't exist prior to this campaign. So it's a bit of a win-win a on both sides. That's more of the role that I think science can play comfortably in this, but it also leads to then practical policy decisions on which sources should we be most concerned about, what parts of the ocean, what parts of the seafood chain, because these radionuclides don't accumulate equally for all forms. Bottom-dwelling fish tend to have higher levels than pelagic, the ones that swim around at the surface off Japan. That's important information to the public who's making a decision on seafood safety. Uh, so there are ways that you directly contribute to those larger arguments with data. And I think that is important because without data, what was happening on the West Coast, as you alluded to, is people were scary stories were coming out. The Pacific Ocean is dead, which is completely nonsensical. But you need some numbers to address some of this false information that you hear. So as an everyday person, what could I do to help this along? Learning more, joining in on campaigns like this. People can take samples, not just for radioactivity, but for other elements. There's studies of different organisms and, and various citizen scientist campaigns, but help out any way you can. It brings people, gets them more engaged than just reading something in a, on a website, for example. So anything people can do on that level, the few people who have resources who can donate and support things where I work, 
Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, 15 plus percent of our income is from private donations and foundations and things. So we need that source and more than ever as science funding has been relatively flat or decreasing. So we need people to also support science of all kinds. And so those are two ways people can help out. Yeah, definitely. We need more science funding. I mean, now during the COVID crisis, we know that we need more science funding for sure. Looking into the future, what makes you hopeful? Well, ocean radioactivity studies, thinking about this, I, I'm I'm a little pessimistic, actually, that we will ever build back the programs. When I started my career, we were there to study the fate of radioactivity in the ocean. And, and I say I'm pessimistic because we need a cadre of people. I'll be retiring someday and Who's going to make the measurements after that point if we don't train a next generation of scientists? We really need to build back some of those programs. What gives me hope was lacking those programs <laughs> is the public who then really did come through in this case and allowed us to get a better handle on radioactivity levels off the West Coast through our radioactive ocean and allowed us to give them some information about you know, radioactivity. You can't smell it. You can't touch it. You can't feel it. You know it's dangerous and bad. Yes, it is. I share all of those concerns. But it's more than just if you see it, you should run away. You know, there are levels that are of greater concern than others, isotopes that are more concerned than others. So there's a lot of detail in there that we want to pass on. Public participation is is a really hopeful sign and a, a good way to do that. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you for being on the show. And thank you for the work that you do. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. I know it's surprising to hear that there isn't more drama and that the most lasting remains of radiation in the ocean are from nuclear weapons testing back in the 50s and 60s. We need to remember that scale really matters. Then we can better understand that Fukushima is not lethal in the way that we expect it or the way that we've been told. There weren't even massive die-offs in the fish population after the accident. The Pacific Ocean is definitely not dead. Maybe the most surprising thing I learned is that there is radioactivity in my basement from radon. The real takeaway for me is that our scientific community and science itself is in danger because of budget cuts and that we are now relying on everyday citizens to collect water samples. Much as I love the initiative of our radioactive ocean for the opportunity that it affords us, we really need to invest in rebuilding our capacity and programs to conduct scientific research properly for the sake of our planet and our humanity. The best thing we can do as citizens now is to do the work to find out the facts and support science of all kinds. Next week, our guest is Fred Pierce. He's the author of Fallout, Disasters, Lies, and the Legacy of the Nuclear Age, and has reported on environmental signs and development issues from 88 countries over the past 30 years. We discuss how nuclear weapons and nuclear power plants are always inextricably linked together, what is really happening with radioactive waste, and what this means for the future of nuclear energy. You could perhaps for a while have said that if the overwhelming long-term threat, indeed short-term threat for the world today revolves around climate change, you could have made the case that nuclear power is a relatively low carbon source of energy, not zero, but relatively low. But now there are so many other low carbon sources of energy, wind power, solar power and tidal power that we know have no need for nuclear power as our only alternative to burning fossil fuels. Most of those alternatives are cheap and getting cheaper, whereas nuclear power is expensive and getting more expensive. And the principal reason for that is to keep it safe. Until next time, stay engaged. I'm Mila Atmos. Thank you for listening to Future Hindsight. The executive producer and host of this program is Mila Atmos. The audio producer and music composer is Peter Fedak. The associate producer is Miriam Zumbul. Additional production by Brooke Sayan. Listen to us online at futurehindsight.com or your favorite streaming service. Mm-hmm.
This podcast is part of the Democracy Group.